The Melody of Crater Lake by Jordan L. My encounter during a camping trip near Crater Lake in Oregon still puzzles me. Crater Lake, known for its deep blue water and legends, seemed like the perfect spot for a solo camping adventure. I was looking for peace and quiet, but what I found was mystery. I set up camp in a secluded spot with a view of the lake. The first day was blissful. I hiked around the area, taking in the stunning scenery. As night fell, I sat by my campfire, the stars reflecting off the lake's surface, creating an almost otherworldly atmosphere. That's when I first heard it, a soft, haunting melody drifting across the lake. It sounded like a flute, but sweeter, more ethereal. I looked around trying to find the source, but there was no one in sight. The music seemed to be coming from the lake itself. Intrigued and a bit unnerved, I decided to investigate. I walked along the shore, the melody growing louder, more compelling. It was as if the music was calling to me, pulling me toward a hidden secret of the lake. As I reached a clearing by the water's edge, the music suddenly stopped. The silence was abrupt, almost jarring. I stood there, confused, looking out over the calm waters. There was a ripple, as if something had just submerged, but other than that, nothing. I returned to my campsite, my mind racing with questions. I barely slept, the memory of the melody replaying in my mind. The next morning, I asked a park ranger about it. He smiled and said that others had reported hearing strange music around the lake, usually at night. Some believed it was the wind, others thought it was something more mystical, but nobody ever thought it was threatening, and neither did I. The rest of my trip was uneventful, but the melody lingered. On my last night I heard it again. This time I just listened, letting the mysterious music wash over me. It almost felt like a farewell, a closing serenade from the depths of Crater Lake. My camping trip there was over, and sadly I had to leave. And as unsettling and sometimes mysterious as I find the whole thing, I'm also really looking forward to going back. Like I said, it didn't strike me as being threatening, just odd. And who couldn't use a little touch of whimsy from time to time? Gold Coast Encounter by Lena. I've always been a skeptic. Ghost stories and supernatural tales were just that, stories. But my experience on the Gold Coast shook that skepticism to its core. I was vacationing in Surfer's Paradise, drawn by its beautiful beaches and lively atmosphere. I rented a small apartment near the beach, a quaint place that seemed perfect for a relaxing getaway. The first few days were exactly what I expected, sun, surf, and the bustling nightlife. But things changed on the fourth night. I returned to my apartment late after a night out. The place was dark and I was too tired to bother with the lights. So I stumbled into my bed in the dim moonlight. Just as I was about to drift off, I heard a faint whisper. It was so soft that I thought I had imagined it. I brushed it off as the wind or maybe a neighbor, but then it happened again. This time, the whisper was clearer, almost like somebody was in the room with me. I sat up, my heart racing, and scanned the dark room for any sign of an intruder. Nothing. Trying to calm my nerves, I got up to get a glass of water. 
That's when I saw it, a shadowy figure standing in the corner of the room. It was human shaped, but seemed to be made of darkness, darker than the surrounding shadows. I froze, not sure if I was seeing things or not. The figure didn't move. It just stood there, like it was watching me. I reached for the light switch, my hands trembling. The moment the light flooded the room, the shadow vanished. There was no one there. No way that somebody could have hidden or escaped without me noticing. I didn't sleep much that night, and the next day I asked the landlord if there had been any strange occurrences in the apartment. He seemed uneasy, avoiding my gaze. He mumbled something about previous tenants complaining about weird happenings, but nothing concrete. The following nights were restless. I would wake up to strange noises, whispers, and once, a chillingly cold breeze that seemed to come from nowhere. Each time I turned on the lights, the room was empty, but the feeling of being watched never left. On my last night, things escalated. I woke up to the sensation of somebody pressing down on my chest. I opened my eyes to the horrifying sight of the shadow figure looming over me. Its form was more defined now, almost like a person cloaked in darkness. I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. I just lay there, frozen in terror. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, it vanished. I was left gasping for air, my heart pounding out of my chest. I turned on every light in the apartment and stayed up until dawn. I cut my vacation short and left the Gold Coast the next day. I couldn't shake the feeling of that shadowy presence. And even now, back in the safety of my own home, I sometimes catch glimpses of something out of the corner of my eye or hear a whisper in the quiet of the night. Part of me thinks I'm not rid of that shadow, at least not yet. My creepy night in the black pine forest. All right, so let me tell you about this super weird thing that happened to me and my buddy Alex in the black pine forest. I don't know its real name, but that's what we called it. We're both pretty chill about ghost stories and all, but this experience was next level. We hit up the forest for a weekend hike. It's got these massive pine trees and it's usually a peaceful spot but locals sometimes chat about it being kind of spooky. We didn't pay much attention to those stories. Day one was all hiking, setting up camp and the usual stuff. Nothing out of the ordinary. The forest was alive with nature sounds, but when night came, things got super quiet. It was just me, Alex, who knocked out early, and our campfire. I wasn't ready to sleep, so I stepped outside the tent for some air. And then I heard something really strange, like whispers, not the wind or animals, but actual whispering. It was coming from the trees around our camp. I was curious and okay, a bit freaked out, but I had to check it out. I grabbed my flashlight and headed into the trees. The whispers got louder as I got closer. It was like a bunch of people talking all at once, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. It was super eerie. As I moved deeper into the forest, the whispers seemed to surround me. I felt this chill, and not just because it was night. It was like someone or something was watching me. I kept going, thinking maybe I'd find some kids pranking campers or something, but nope, there was nobody there. Then the whispering just stopped, like completely. One second it was there, the next total silence. I stood there, flashlight in hand, feeling my heart racing. I didn't know whether to bolt back to camp or keep looking around. After what felt like ages, I decided to head back. I didn't mention anything to Alex because I didn't want to freak him out, but I barely slept that night, listening for any more whispers, which thankfully didn't come back. The next day we packed up and hiked back. 
I did a little bit of digging and found out the Black Pine Forest was known for this kind of thing. Stories of unexplained sounds, shadows, and even ghost sightings. I wish I knew that before, but honestly, it probably wouldn't have stopped us. So yeah, that's my creepy story from the woods. No idea what those whispers were, but it's something I'll never forget. The Hike That Never Ended My encounter on the trails of Mount San Antonio in California, also known as Mount Baldy, still sends shivers down my spine. I've always been an avid hiker, seeking out nature's challenges. Mount Baldy, with its rugged beauty and challenging trails, seemed like the perfect weekend escape. But that weekend turned into a surreal, never-ending loop of confusion and fear. I started my hike early in the morning, the sun just beginning to cast its golden hues over the landscape. The trail was clear, and I was well prepared with supplies and a map. I planned to reach the summit and return before dusk. The ascent was breathtaking, both in its scenic beauty and in its physical demand. I reached the summit by early afternoon, feeling a sense of accomplishment as I took in the panoramic view. After a short rest, I began my descent, expecting it to be straightforward. But as I hiked down, an unsettling fog began to roll in, thick and disorienting. I checked my compass and map frequently, but something seemed off. The trail markers, once clear, now became sporadic and hard to follow. The landscape, so familiar on my ascent, felt strangely different. Hours passed, and I should have been nearing the base, but the trail just kept going. The fog grew denser, and a chilling sense of isolation set in. I tried to retrace my steps, thinking I might have taken a wrong turn, but the path behind me was just as confusing. As night fell, I realized I was lost. The fog was so thick now that my flashlight barely cut through it. I decided to stop and set up a makeshift camp, hoping to wait out the fog until morning. But the strangest part came with the dawn. When the sun rose, the fog lifted, revealing not the familiar trails of Mount Baldy, but an unrecognizable dense forest. I was on a completely different path, one I had no recollection of taking. My map was useless here. Panicked, I started walking, hoping to find my way out or run into another hiker. But the forest seemed endless, the trees a repeating pattern of eerie similarity. I walked for hours, but it felt like I wasn't making any progress at all. It was as if the forest was reshaping itself around me. Then I heard voices, distant and echoing. They seemed to be calling my name. I followed them thinking that it might be other hikers or a search party looking for me, but the voices led me in circles, always out of reach, their whispers tinged with an unsettling familiarity. By the time I found my way out of the forest, it was night again. I emerged onto a trail that led me back to the base of Mount Baldy. How I got there, or where I had been, I still can't explain. I was found by a park ranger who told me I had been missing for two days. They'd been searching for me, thinking that I had fallen or injured myself. The experience on Mount Baldy has left me bewildered and deeply unsettled. I've hiked those trails before and since, and nothing like that has ever happened again. I can't explain the shifting landscape, the endless forest, or the voices that seem to echo out of nowhere. The hike on Mount Baldy was more than just a physical journey. It was a brush with something I have no way of understanding. And whatever it was, it will be with me forever. Mm -hmm. 
Sleigh Bells Ring by J.R. Our eerie encounter in the Smoky Mountains started as a group camping trip aimed at exploring the natural beauty and rugged terrain of one of America's most beloved national parks. But what we experienced over those few nights has left each of us questioning the reality of the wilderness that surrounds us. Our group, five in total, set up camp in a secluded area, surrounded by dense forests and a clear view of the starry sky. The first day was an adventure, filled with hiking and sightseeing and everything we had gone there for. As night fell, we gathered around the campfire, shared some stories, and were pretty much just enjoying the peaceful ambiance of the mountains. Then we started to hear a noise. We all kind of sat up and looked around, trying to figure out what it was. It was ringing, like the sound of small bells echoing throughout the forest. It was faint, but distinct, encircling our campsite. It was kind of close to Christmas, and so we kind of joked about it, making up stories of Santa or forest fairies or lost hikers with jingle bells. But as the ringing continued, a sense of unease settled over us. Eventually, we shrugged it off as a quirk of the forest. Maybe somebody had weird wind chimes on a cabin somewhere, or maybe it was some kind of natural phenomenon. We figured we'd look it up when we got home and thought nothing of it. We went to bed, and even though it was kind of strange, the sound of the bells did sort of lull us to sleep. The next morning, we found something that turned the whole ordeal from something whimsical to something downright scary. Right in the middle of our campsite, there lay a single sleigh bell, old and slightly rusted. None of us had seen it before, none of us owned anything like it, and none of us could explain how it got there. The sight of it, so out of place this deep in the wilderness, was deeply unsettling. Every single night of our trip, the scenario repeated. The distant ringing of bells, always starting at nightfall and continuing until dawn. Every morning, we would find another singular sleigh bell in the middle of camp. We searched the area, thinking maybe somebody was playing a prank on us, but we never found another sign of a human presence anywhere. Our conversations about the bells became more serious and speculative. We discussed everything from pranksters to supernatural explanations, but none of it made sense. The Smoky Mountains are rich with folklore and legends, but none that we knew of mentioned mysterious bells. On our last night, the ringing was louder, more insistent. It felt like whatever was making the noise was getting closer and more intentional. We barely slept, the sound of bells consuming our thoughts. In the morning, we found not one, but several sleigh bells scattered around our tents one for each of us, to be exact. We packed up and left the mountains with more questions than we dared to admit, more questions than any of us really wanted answers to. We talked about reporting it, but what on earth would we say? We were stalked by Santa? It sounded absurd even to us. Hey, we'd like to report sleigh bells in the woods and random bells in our campsite. I mean, come on. Ever since that trip, we've all stayed in touch, Occasionally, we bring up the bells and our theories. Some of us have tried to research similar occurrences, but so far we've come up empty-handed. So here we are, asking if anybody else has experienced this in the Smoky Mountains. The Forgotten Campsite It all started as a weekend camping trip with my two best friends, Alex and Jenna, in the remote woods of Oregon. We had planned this getaway for weeks, aiming for a spot known as the Forgotten Campsite, named so due to its seclusion and the tales that hikers occasionally stumbled upon it by chance. We set out early, our backpacks laden with the essentials, the excitement palpable among us. 
the hike to the campsite was challenging but beautiful, taking us through dense forests and along a meandering river. By late afternoon, we found it, a small clearing with an old rusted fire ring at its center, the ground flattened by previous campers. We set up our tents and gathered wood for a fire. As night fell, we cooked dinner over the flames, sharing stories and laughter under the starlit sky. Everything was perfect, or so it seemed. Later, as we settled into our tents, a sense of unease crept over me. The forest, lively with sounds during the day, was eerily silent, as if all the nocturnal creatures had suddenly vanished. I tried to sleep, attributing my unease to the new surroundings. In the middle of the night, I was awakened by a faint whispering outside my tent. At first, I thought it was Alex or Jenna, but a quick glance showed them both asleep. I listened, heart racing, as the whispering grew louder, a chorus of indistinct voices that seemed to encircle our campsite. I nudged Alex awake and he heard it too. We cautiously unzipped the tent, half expecting to find somebody playing a prank, but the clearing was empty, the whispering voices now fading away into the night. The next morning, we discussed the event. Jenna, a very heavy sleeper, had heard nothing. Alex and I were perplexed, but decided that it might have been the wind or some nocturnal animal. As the day progressed, we tried to put the incident behind us, exploring the nearby woods and river. But the sense of unease lingered, a shadow over our previously cheerful spirits. That night, the whispering returned, more coherent this time. We could almost make out words, but not in any language that we recognized. This time, Jenna heard it too. Terrified, we huddled together in one tent, none of us daring to step outside. The next day, we decided to cut our trip short. As we hurriedly packed our gear, I noticed something strange. Small stone-like objects arranged in a circle around our campsite. They had not been there before. The arrangement was deliberate, almost ritualistic. We left the forgotten campsite with more questions than answers. Who had whispered in the night? What did the stone circle signify? Our search for answers in the following weeks turned up nothing. This camping trip, meant to be an escape from the mundane, which I suppose it was, turned into an ordeal that we still talk about to this very day. A few months ago, an experience at the end of an exhausting work shift left me questioning reality and my own sanity. I'm a nurse, and I had just started a new job at a nursing home about 45 minutes away. The pay was good, and the hours suited me, especially the 16-hour weekend double shifts. But on one particular weekend, my routine was disrupted when they asked me to work both morning and evening. That Sunday night, my relief was late. I wasn't too bothered since I was already behind on charting. But then things got busier, as a resident fell and had to be sent to the ER. After handling the situation and the additional paperwork, I finally left work at about 1 to 2 in the morning, ending up with nearly a 20-hour shift following a 17-hour shift the day before. I was drained, but I felt okay to drive. My car is too small to sleep in, and I couldn't get a hold of a friend. My route home is scenic, with twists, turns, and views of the lake, which usually helps me keep awake. But that night, I realized I had left my glasses behind. My vision was blurry, but I was too exhausted to turn back. As I was driving through a wooded area, a bright light, like a spotlight, caught my eye. It was coming through the trees, as I followed the road, I came across a thin figure, dressed in skin-tight black clothes, kneeling over a deer by the side of the road. The spotlight was directed at him. I remember thinking how strange it was, but my thoughts were slow 
and my eyes were straining without my glasses. I slowed down and rolled down my window, asking if he needed any help. The figure turned, and I was frozen by what I saw. It wasn't human. It was tall, with a large head and enormous eyes, like an alien depicted in stories, but not small and frail. It began to approach my car, and a voice in my head commanded, Sleep. I blinked, and suddenly it was gone, along with the deer, and it was nearly 4 a.m. My car was parked, and I had no memory of pulling over. I tried to call my sister, but I ended up calling my workplace instead. The colleague who answered stayed on the line until I got home, under the pretense that I had fallen asleep and didn't want it to happen again. I tell myself that I must have fallen asleep, that it was all a big hallucination born of exhaustion. But deep down, I'm haunted by the thought, the knowledge, that it was real. The fear of what might have happened, whether from falling asleep at the wheel or encountering something completely inexplicable, still lingers. I haven't shared this story with anyone, as it terrifies me just to think about it. But it's a memory that refuses to fade, leaving me forever wondering, what if? I'm wondering if anybody has any information about the Omni Bedford Springs in Pennsylvania. I live very close, and I used to go there daily to swim. It flooded when I was a child. In the early 2000s, Omni bought it and restored it, while adding on as well. Construction workers reported many strange occurrences. It was James Buchanan's summer White House. It was a facility to hold foreign diplomats during the wars. The springs are known to have healing properties. I have always felt a presence in the old section of the main hotel. I swam laps there for years in the famous pool. One day, they were filling the pool, and the hose was still. They fill it using the natural spring water from the mountain. About 15 minutes later, it looked as if a child was holding it and playing with it, swinging it around. My friend and I always swam together, and we both saw it, and then, we both saw it suddenly stop. On other occasions, we would hear splashing when nobody was in the pool. One time, I felt a huge movement in the water while swimming. Nobody was there, though. We were the only ones there, and my friend wasn't in the pool. We also spotted a gentleman at the top of the stairs to the balcony, where the band used to play for the pool, but nobody was there when we looked again. I have also sat in the library many times reading while waiting on my friend to arrive, or before I hit the road. I would hear sounds. I'm not sure what the room used to be, but the windows are scratched from brides testing their diamonds, I was told. They also have some of the guest ledgers there. All of the things that happened to me were between 3 in the morning and 6 in the morning. Does anybody have any idea what's going on there? For some backstory, I'm a 26-year-old female. I grew up in a very haunted house. The woods were also haunted. It was in rural Appalachian, Pennsylvania. Our area had a lot of mining and Native American history. The oldest known site of human habitation was just a few miles away. Our house was also built near the portal to an abandoned mine, where an accident took place. I've experienced noises, voices, things moving, and figures from a young age. I assume I have attachments. I no longer live in my childhood home. Things have started everywhere that I lived to some extent, but never as bad as there. This post is about where I live now, and I'm hoping to get some advice on what to do, 
or some possible reasons behind it. Currently, I moved in with my partner, who's a 26-year-old male, last summer. He bought the home in 2020 and says that he never experienced anything and neither did his roommate. I moved in right after the roommate moved out. It was built in the 50s, no odd history that I know of. It's a pretty quiet suburb, right outside the city. One of the things that happens is that things move. I remember carrying a military duffel bag upstairs while I was moving in, and I stacked one on top of the other. A few hours later, I heard a loud bang upstairs. The top one was on the floor, in front of the bottom one. It wasn't like it rolled off, but more like it had been placed, or dropped. It was upright. A few days later, my folded flag from my re-enlistment was knocked off the windowsill, but all the windows were closed and I checked for drafts. Two weeks ago, I actually watched my partner's GameCube slide over about two inches on our TV stand. It's not plugged into anything. It's just the box sitting there, so it's not like the dogs could have pulled the cables. This was a common theme in my childhood home as well. It got so bad I had to fall asleep with movies on, because if it was silent, I would have to listen to things falling off my dressers, toys falling, things sliding, and so on. Another thing that happens is footsteps. I've heard heavy boot footsteps coming up the stairs and stopping in front of the bedroom door multiple times. It sounds so real that I've actually grabbed my gun thinking someone broke in. The last time it happened, a few weeks ago, my dogs heard it and walked over to the door. They didn't bark, they just sniffed. Most of the time it happens when I'm home alone, but there was one time when my partner heard it too. This has also happened at multiple locations. I've heard the same heavy footsteps that stop at the doorway at my ex's house and also an apartment I lived in. I've also seen figures. It was early morning, I was half asleep and I heard the footsteps. This time they came into the room. I thought it was my partner home from work. When I opened my eyes, he was already laying next to me and sleeping. I didn't see anything. Nobody was in the room. When he woke up, I told him about it and he said that he had a dream that night where someone was in the house walking around and that he saw a figure standing in our room, a black figure with weird eyes. He said that he's dreamed about a figure in our room a few times since he started seeing me. My ex also experienced the same thing and would sometimes see black figures or a man with a mustache in the room in his dreams, but only when he was with me. One of my friends also saw a man with a mustache standing next to my bunk in her dream while we were at training a few years ago. We've heard voices as well. My partner has heard me calling his name or saying, babe, in the next room when I'm actually upstairs and didn't say anything. This has happened about five times. It's another thing that used to happen to me in the house that I grew up in. I would hear a woman saying my name in the next room when my mom wasn't home. Last night, I woke up and saw the shadow of my dog sitting upright on the end of our bed. I could see the shape blocking out the light of the TV behind him. I could see shoulders. Sometimes my dog gets too hot and can't sleep and will sit up like that. So I reached forward to pet him and my hand didn't touch a thing. He was actually laying down flat on his side the shadow was behind him. I didn't have my contact lenses in, so I couldn't see too clearly. My regular eyesight is horrible. I just see shapes. I turned my phone flashlight on, and the upright shadow disappeared. I haven't seen a figure since I lived in the first house, which is why I'm concerned. Little things have always started after I moved in somewhere but it's escalating faster this time. This brings me back to the mine behind our childhood home. Two months ago, my two brothers, my partner and I decided to go back to those woods and try to find the entrance. 
Well, we found it. The portal was collapsed, and they tried digging it out. We found pieces of the old mine cars, and we all brought a little something home. Do you think it could be escalating because we went back? And not only that, I brought a piece of a mine car into our house without even thinking about the repercussions? Now I'm worried. I haven't told my partner about the figure. And now, I'm just wondering what comes next. I'm a skeptic, but I used to be obsessed with anything paranormal. I lost interest as I got older. I used to believe anything that I would see on those weird History Channel shows about Bigfoot and UFOs. It's not like I think that any of this is impossible, it's just that I'm much harder to convince now. I try to take any footage or pictures of this stuff as rationally as I can. Usually, the simplest explanation is the explanation. Ironically though, I saw something that no matter how hard I try, I cannot explain. Years ago, I was at a party at a house surrounded by woods. Miles and miles of isolated Pennsylvania mountains. I got bored and I asked my cousin if he wanted to go for a walk. As we left the property, we had to go down a pretty deep slope that was crowded by rusted out cars, which had been there for over a decade. We found a clearing with a shack that looked like somebody was in the process of demolishing it. And after looking inside, we went back to the party to grab my younger brother. This was back when I was still pretty invested in the paranormal. So before we walked into the clearing again, I got the camera ready on my phone, just in case. The sun was starting to set, and as we left the tree line, I saw it. Something streaked out in front of me. It was a line of small bluish orbs, and honestly the best way I can describe it is like the fairies in Ocarina of Time, except they moved so much faster. They were only there for a second, fading in and then fading out, almost faster than I could react. I managed to take a picture, but I thought, there's no way I managed to get that. With the sun going down, we had to investigate the shack quickly. I took a few more pictures of the inside and hurried out of there. When we got back, I looked through the photos, and to my absolute shock, I did manage to get whatever the heck that was. The photo came out strange, though. The photo was more like an elongated blob of bright yellow and white, not what I had seen. Surprisingly, nobody seemed to believe me, other than a couple of close friends who were into weird things too. Everybody told me that I was mistaken, and one friend even accused me of fabricating it. The worst one was my dad. This dude will believe any fringe idea or conspiracy theory. For example, he once got a ghost detecting app and was absolutely convinced that his dead cousin was trying to contact him from beyond the grave through a free iPhone app. Of course, he thought I was lying about this though. I tried to come up with some kind of explanation for what I saw, but I couldn't. I'm not going to say it was a ghost or a spirit because I would have no way of proving that. Electromagnetic fields can make people see things like that, but that doesn't explain the fact that I had a picture of it, even if it was different. I'm not convinced that it was any weather phenomenon either, since it was a bright, sunny summer day. And fireflies don't look like amorphous blobs of light on camera. Really, all I know is what it wasn't. I guess in true story fashion, those pictures are stuck on a phone and a laptop that no longer work. I am planning on trying to retrieve them at some point. I don't believe the picture had anything to do with the computer or the phone breaking, of course. I've heard people say stuff about ghost pictures causing electronics to stop working. But both of those devices were pretty old, and they didn't stop working until years after I took those pictures. 
Whether or not you believe me is fine, but I hope you enjoyed the story anyway. Just this weekend, my cousins from the city in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, visited me and my family down here in southern Pennsylvania, near Maryland. We live in the boondocks, and there are many trails for people who enjoy horseback riding and taking rides on ATVs. When my cousins got to my house, we decided to go exploring toward my neighbor's house, who lives in the middle of the woods, isolated in a log cabin. We walked a trail the whole way up there for about a mile, joking along the way. Let me give you a little backstory about the place. Back in the 1800s, there was a bar and a few small cabins for people to stay in. A group of men got drunk one night and attempted to shoot bottles off of each other's heads. People died, and the wives of the men who had died burned down the bar and the cabins then were later hanged by the bar owners. This happened right below where we were exploring. Legend says that the women and the people who died in the fires still lurk around the forest. Another incident took place in the 80s or 90s. A teen was driving really fast with his friend at that exact same location as where the bar incident took place. The teen crashed into a tree, beheading his friend believing him alive. The teen was tried for manslaughter as he was driving drunk. This place is destined for bad luck. So we're exploring on this trail, approaching the house. As we approached, we heard a very distant whistle, but we thought nothing of it. As it is spring and it was warm on this day, so there were birds around. But when we stopped to take a break, we heard twigs snap. We all froze as a giant branch fell, and then the tree. It was a dead tree that was easy to push down. I looked behind and saw a human figure. As it set in with my brain, I realized that it was a man in ripped, ragged overalls that had no more color and a worn out, colorless plaid flannel. He looked no older than 40. He looked at us for a while and then ran at us with a bat-like stick while laughing like a maniac. We ran the other way until we got cut off by an electrical fence. Then we turned the other way. By this time, we were way off trail and in the middle of the woods. But I knew that all I had to do was go down to get back on trail. By the time we got the trail, we lost him. He looked real enough to us. But whether he was a spirit or a real person, we're never going back up there again. My boyfriend and I stayed at the Hotel Pennsylvania this weekend. It's known for being haunted, and it looks like it fits the part. It's old and the rooms are run down. When we checked in, we got our keys and went to our room on the 12th floor. The keys didn't work, so we went down and got new ones. Those didn't work either. A worker there had to let us in, and he said he didn't know why our keys wouldn't work, because the key thing on the door was working just fine. Anyway, last night I fell asleep at about 1, while my boyfriend stayed up for a little bit. He says that at about two o'clock, I sat up, opened my eyes, and looked like I hadn't been sleeping at all. He said all the hair on my body looked like it stood up. And then I said to him, the door is open, and then fell back down and went to sleep. He said five minutes later, the light on the bedside table next to me turned on by itself. He decided to just ignore the situation and go to bed. He got up early at about 6.15 to go to the gym. On his way, he passed a woman in the hallway that he didn't know. 
He greeted her, and all she said was, the door is closing now, and continued walking. So, I should start this by saying, I'm a healthy, sane, 18-year-old male. I've never had hallucinations or been seriously sick in my life. I've also never been known to black out or take micro naps. My mother has schizophrenia, but as far as I know, it was pretty mild, and I've never had any symptoms of it. With all of that out of the way, here's what happened. I was hanging out with my significant other before they went to class at college and before I had to go to work. We parted ways and I got on the bus to go home and get ready. I got on the bus with five other people and I sat in the back, as I usually do, so all five were in front of me. I looked down to check my phone when the bus started to move so I could check the route, because I'm a nervous person and I wanted to make sure that I was on the right route. I was. I looked up after maybe 30 seconds, and I'm absolutely positive that the bus had not stopped to let anyone off. Somehow though, all five of the people that I had gotten on with were just gone. The only people on the bus were me and the driver. It freaked me out a good bit because the next bus stop was still up ahead, so there's no way the bus had stopped and let people out in the middle of the road. I checked my phone again to get my mind off of it, and then suddenly the bus turned onto a different street, which is weird since the route had no turns. It was a straight line. I'm very much into horror, so my immediate thought was, great, I guess I'm going to hell. I signaled that I wanted to get off though, and the driver let me off without saying anything. I've been thinking about this all day, and I still have no idea what could have happened there. I know it's not as creepy as some stories, but it genuinely freaked me out. I wasn't sure where to tell this story, and I probably sound crazy, but this definitely happened. A while ago, I was on the bus back home with my little girl. We had just had a really fun day out. I felt this strong energy, and I wanted to investigate, but with my awkwardness, I just kept my head down. Although I kept thinking, what is it about that group of older women that was in the front? And why does it feel like this energy is coming from that direction? This was not just somebody giving off vibes. The feeling was so intense. I'm usually good at reading people, but this just hit different. It wasn't bad either. It felt warm, inviting, familiar and so intense that it made the air around me feel tight, but not in a suffocating way, like a hug from your grandma. I decided to properly look, and this woman caught my attention straight away. Not long after, it was her stop, and I never saw her again. A week ago, on the way home again, I feel this energy again. I look up, and lo and behold, it's the same woman. At this point, the energy was so intense that I nearly got teary-eyed. She started to smile at me when I started feeling that way, but not in a creepy way, just kind of happy. She was sat on the folding down chairs at the front and kept looking down the aisle. I knew she was noticing me, but not making direct eye contact. It felt like she knew that I knew. I know this may sound ridiculous, and it was just based off of a feeling, but it's a feeling I haven't been able to shake. I'm still not entirely sure what happened, if anything. But it was interesting, and I wanted to share.
For some background, whenever I took the bus for school, I was pretty much alone on bus rides. I was always on one of those small buses. We didn't have any other kids on there, but the highest amount of kids on the bus was probably around five, including me. I was the only one from my school on that bus. All of the other kids went to the same school. And it wasn't mine. Plus, I've had about four different bus drivers in my time. The one I'm going to talk about lost her husband about a year before, and she was out for a long time. She had just gotten back when this took place. This happened about four or five years ago, and I was still pretty young. For morning rides, we dropped off the other kids, and we were heading to my school. We were the only ones on the road when the bus suddenly stops on the side of the road. I was really confused. I thought maybe the bus had broken down, but being the shy kid that I was, I didn't say anything. I just waited. Then the bus driver opened the door. I started to feel a bit uneasy. We weren't at my school yet, and there was nobody there, so why was she opening it? She stared out the door for like two minutes, when I finally said, Are you okay? I asked. Without looking away from the door, she said in such a low voice that it gave me chills, There's a man there. There was no man there. No person at all. She kept staring for a couple of seconds, when she finally closed the door and continued driving down the road. She wasn't my bus driver after that year, and I do miss her. She was a very sweet lady. But that moment still freaks me out. I sometimes think that maybe the man she saw was her husband. I don't know who else she would open a school bus door to. I don't know why she would stop the bus in the first place, especially for a stranger. Maybe she saw her husband and it wasn't until after the door was open that she realized he was dead and that's why she stared. I don't really know what happened that day, but I'll never forget it. I worked the late shift for this company about six years ago. I would get off at midnight and the company bus would take us home. My neighborhood was the farthest, so I would be brought home last. I should also mention that the road that this happened on has had multiple strange incidents. Accidents, murders, ghostly sightings, strange creatures, just a whole lot of weird stuff. On the last part of the journey, there were three of us left on the bus. After the driver confirmed our addresses, we continued. I was at the front of the bus. A young lady in the middle and a guy at the back were the other two passengers. We got to the guy's street and the driver stopped and waited for him to get off. After getting impatient, the driver asked the lady to go check if he was sleeping. She came running back to the front of the bus, crying and praying. We asked her what was wrong, and she said that there was nobody back there, and she wanted to go home right now. The driver switched on the lights and floored it. It gets even creepier. After getting off on my street, I began to walk to my house. This was now at about two o'clock in the morning. Every dog that I would walk past kept staring at something behind me. When I turned to look, there was nothing. There was no shadow, no sound, no body. After getting inside my house, I looked out the window for the next 10 minutes. It was just dead silence and dogs staring at nothing. I've never been able to figure out what happened that night, but it was freaky. bus driver for TransLink, 
Bus 169. It goes through the Riverview Hospital complex in Coquitlam, BC. It's an abandoned mental asylum and hospital complex with most of its buildings run down and just a couple still in operation. It's actually the site of a lot of filming due to how eerie some of the buildings look. I was on my last shift of the night. Always on edge, of course, because it's super eerie late at night there. Luckily, I had a couple at the back of the bus, so I wasn't exactly alone while driving through this place. As I was driving through, I saw a man sitting at the bus stop. Immediately, I was filled with dread because it was after midnight and I doubted that somebody would randomly be waiting for a bus at this hour, especially since this complex was closed off to the public at 9 p.m. every day. So I had to do what I had to do, and I pulled over to let the man in. But the strange thing is, when I opened the door, there was no one there on the seat, and I was pretty sure I saw a person. So I just closed the door and gunned it, I was not going outside to check. That would be a rookie mistake. Anyway, I make it the rest of the route okay, and I pull up to the last stop at the bus loop. I disengaged the locking mechanism for the back door for the couple to get out. Then I heard a guy at the back say, what the, and I turned around and I saw the back door was open, but the couple was still making their way toward the door. Our buses are equipped with a pressure-sensitive push bar that activates the door to open when pushed against it. I had disengaged the lock to allow the doors to be pushed open. I asked the couple what the problem was, but I already knew what it was before they said it. The door had opened by itself. I don't know if it was just a malfunction or what, and maybe it was a coincidence that it was the same night that I stopped the bus for a man who wasn't there. But maybe we had a ghost passenger that night. I'm not sure what to do about driving that route. I really don't want to anymore. When I was a kid, I was sitting in the back seat of my parents' car, traveling through a built-up area, when my brother, who was sitting next to me, suddenly cried out in fear. My mom was in the front passenger seat and quickly turned around to ask what the matter was. My brother said, I've just seen a woman standing in a bus shelter and she didn't have a face. He then went on to explain that where her face should have been, there was just a gaping hole, but it was glowing white. The bus shelter had been on my side of the road, but I had been looking out the front, so I never saw anything. I asked my mom if we could go back and see if the woman was still there, but my brother was genuinely scared and begged us not to. At the time, my mom said that she thought it was just her car's headlights flashing in the woman's face. But the way my brother was so scared definitely made me question that explanation. I'm a middle school teacher and coach in a rural area outside of San Antonio, Texas. As a part of my coaching contract, I have to get my CDL and bus my athletes to and from games. After our last game of the volleyball season, I was driving the bus back to the bus barn. It was around 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, so it was already super dark and there weren't many cars out. But I've driven this part a million times and I was just excited to return the bus and get home to my husband and dogs. The bus I had wasn't anything special. It was just an old sub bus from 2004. There are cameras inside that don't record audio, apparently, and a few switches were broken. But as long as the brakes worked, 
and the bus got as close to 50 miles per hour as it could, it was perfect. I was approaching a bridge when a whispering voice began to speak through the radio. This didn't surprise me much because there's usually an interference near this bridge due to it being near the train tracks. Plus lots of cops hide here to catch speeders. I wasn't really familiar with the way these radios worked, but it helped me feel better about it. The closer I got to the bridge though, the louder the whisper through the radio was. I began to make out words like slow, sit, and no. As soon as I started to go underneath the bridge, I did a mirror check just to make sure I had enough room on the sides. Everything seemed normal until I looked in the inside mirror that could see all of the seats behind me. Sitting in the very back row on my right was a figure. It was pure black, just a black abyss sitting straight up in the seat as if it was one of my athletes. At first I thought it was a shadow, but as the bus moved, it stayed put, unlike the shadows around it. After about five seconds, as I pulled away from the bridge, the figure vanished. The voice on the radio had paused, but then I clearly heard it say in a static low voice, turn around. I snapped my eyes forward, terrified, and pressed the gas a little harder, praying that I could get this old bus to go faster. The bus bar and gate was open and about 50 yards away, and I only stopped when I parked the bus. I did a quick sweep of the inside to make sure that nobody had stowed away and that this was some kind of prank, but there was nothing out of the ordinary. I asked the other coaches the next day if they had ever had any weird experiences around the bridge, but they said no. I'm going to ask the coaches at the other schools as well. I did get a chance to tell this story to one of the bus drivers that I get to see most mornings during the AM drop-off. He's an older driver who's been around since 2001. He mentioned that gangs used to race down that stretch of road all the time back in the early 2000s. One day, a race ended in a fiery crash just before the bridge, and a young man lost his life. The bus driver had heard similar stories to mine about the radio near the bridge, but never had anybody said that they had seen an apparition before. I asked if he knew of somebody I could contact to see the footage from the camera on the bus, but he laughed and said that they would probably think I was crazy and drug test me on the spot. This was the scariest experience I've ever had driving a bus. I pass that bridge every day on the way to work, and it just gives me chills. I don't have to drive a bus again for another three months, but I'm already dreading it. My cat and I were on the bus heading up to a takeaway so I could get food for us. The nice lady sells tuna to me for my cat. And I saw multiple figures get onto the bus out of the corner of my eye. My cat even meowed at them. But when I stood up, there was no one around other than the driver. I asked the driver if anybody else had gotten on. And he just kind of shook his head and gave me this worried look. I think he had seen what I had seen, but didn't want to address it. On my walk home that night from the chippy, I saw numerous shadows in the fog, which startled my cat so much that he actually jumped off my shoulder, and I later found him at home. Usually my cat is really well behaved, so I have no idea, but that night and that night bus were freaky. A few years back, 
My mom was coming home after spending the afternoon at my auntie's, cousin's, and their kid's house. When she got home, mom told my husband and I about the incident she experienced waiting for a bus. We come from a family of healers and sensitives, so I've had paranormal and supernatural experiences all my life, as has the rest of my family. My mom, although slightly skeptical and a bit reluctant to embrace the gifts which our ancestors passed down to us, has had her fair share of unexplained events in her own life. She told us that while she was waiting for the bus, she suddenly saw movement out of the corner of her eye. Across the road, she saw three young people. In usual circumstances, this wouldn't be out of the ordinary at all, as the shops are regular meeting places for all the local teenagers. However, there was something slightly odd about these young people. My mom said that they were dressed in the period of the 1970s, when my mom was a young teenager. People were milling about around them, very near them, but nobody was acknowledging them. Their existence was completely overlooked by other people, as if they were invisible. My mom was distracted for a brief moment, and when she looked back again where the mysterious teenagers had been, they were gone. She even watched the only open shop, as she thought maybe they had gone in. She waited until her bus came, 20 minutes later, but they didn't come out. There was nowhere else they could have gone in the time that my mom wasn't watching them. Mom said the most unsettling thing about it was how normal these teenagers looked, but the fact that she was the only one that seemed to be able to see them. It's a story she still tells today. I had moved into a new apartment with a roommate who was related to a friend of mine. This apartment was located on the opposite side of town and I was not familiar with this area when I moved there. A lot of these apartments were literally newly built, but a lot of the lots around the area were still being developed and it was a very desolate part of town. Most of the area before construction began was large amounts of old farm areas that were unkempt and no longer lived on. I am very sensitive to the paranormal, and during this time I was just beginning to understand why there was so much paranormal energy around me. My fear was literally a beacon, as my aunt explained to me. The very first event I experienced after moving into my new apartment happened within a week. At the time, I didn't have my own car, and besides getting rides from friends, I mostly had to take the bus to get to work. The bus stop that I had to walk to was pretty far away from the apartment complex. There was a lot of new construction everywhere on that road in front of the complex, but there was a gas station and a very small shopping plaza that was mostly empty, except for a bank and a small mom and pop grocery store. I used to sometimes stop at this grocery store and get some Starbucks iced coffee before walking to the bus stop. One very early morning, I want to say maybe around 5.30 a.m., I was walking to the bus stop. I had my earbuds in and I was just walking along, not really paying attention to my surroundings. Suddenly I got a very cold chill up and down my spine and I got the distinct feeling that someone was walking behind me. I turned around, but nobody was there. I got a little nervous and left one of my earbuds out just to keep myself a little more alert. I continued walking and was almost to the shopping plaza when I heard running footsteps behind me. I turned around again, and even though I continued hearing the footsteps and was totally frozen in fear, I didn't see anything. I couldn't move a muscle. And then I heard something rustle in the bushes next to the sidewalk very close to me, and the footsteps stopped. I caught my breath 
and for some reason the energy that I felt was not a positive one. So I decided to sprint to the little grocery store in the plaza. I calmed myself down long enough to walk over and buy what I needed. Then I realized I had at least another seven to eight minutes to walk to get to the bus stop. As I near the door to leave the store, in the parking lot, I see as clear as day a figure of a man that seemed like he was standing in his own fog. I honestly couldn't tell any of his features, but as soon as he seemed to realize that I saw him, he vanished before my eyes. I looked around to see if maybe anybody else had seen it, but it was 5.50 a.m. at this point, and no one was in the store with me except for the person at the register. I gathered my courage and forced myself to walk to the bus stop. As I'm waiting for the bus to arrive, I again started to feel a shiver and my heartbeat quickened. I got up from the bench where I was waiting and began to look around, but I couldn't see anything. Then, I swear as I breathe, I heard directly in my ear the voice of a man say, I'm sorry. As I'm typing this story out, I literally have chills just remembering the sound of his voice. I instantly knew that it was the figure I had seen in the parking lot. I stood there so freaked out, almost in tears, and the bus finally came to get me. After this happened to me, I paid my friend to drive me to work for the next two months. A lot of other weird things have happened, but this tops the list. I was in the middle of nowhere, and I heard a knock on my car's mirror. I work as a security guard in various hospitals, and I keep on changing sites during my shift because that's what my job requires me to do. I was going to another site tonight at about 12.30 in the morning, when I stopped my car at a signal. The roads were pretty empty, emptier than usual, maybe due to the long weekend here in Canada. It was all dark around and not even a single person or car. Then when I stopped at the signal, my car just turned off automatically. Then I heard some kind of knock, as though somebody was knocking on the back mirror of my car. I looked around from the inside, but I couldn't see anybody. I checked all the mirrors and the doors and they were all locked and then I left. There was nobody and nothing around that could have made that noise. And I'm just wondering if anybody can explain this. Back in 2019, my girlfriend and I went on a vacation to an island in Italy. Everything went well, except that the last day it did rain a little bit. It didn't rain a lot though. The streets were dry, but the sky was gray, and we came back to our little house at about 5 p.m. because of the weather. We got bored pretty quickly, and we had to wait at least three or four hours before going to eat at a restaurant. So I decided to visit the only part of the island I hadn't seen. We got on the motorbike and went to Calafante, which I found out was totally abandoned due to a collapse that had happened in 2017. The whole neighborhood was as neglected and deserted as the beach and the restaurant were. And I swear we passed through every house, road, or parking lot. And it was just deserted. Nobody lived there, not even a tourist or a car. I think that the collapse of the beach made that spot a little bit less interesting. Anyway, I kept driving in that neighborhood until I ended up at a dead-end street near a football field. But there were two kids playing football on the end of the street, and people noticed that every house nearby was shut closed. Not a single sign of a human being for kilometers, so where did these two kids come from? 
We got close and my girlfriend and I were already a little bit freaked out. But I wanted to talk to them because if I remember correctly, I was looking for a place that I couldn't find and I thought perhaps they would know where it was. We approached them. They were no more than six or seven years old, dirty as hell, like just came out of a coal mine dirty. One kid had a white, more like a gray, dirty and torn t-shirt, and the other only had his rag-like pants on. Both of them were without shoes and with their hair completely shaved. The shirtless kid had a circular wound, more like a hole right in the middle of his pectorals. It was red, bloody, and new, like he had just been shot in the middle of the chest. I asked them this thing and they answered me, but I couldn't understand a thing. It wasn't like the local dialect or any Italian dialect at all. It was completely incomprehensible. They kept talking and pointing at my bike. We couldn't understand a thing, so we just said goodbye and made a U-turn. I could see them staring at us from my mirrors. We were so freaked out. They looked pretty injured, but they were acting super casual. I don't know why, but my girlfriend and I are pretty sure they were some kind of ghost. Like maybe kids that died in the World War or something like that. I don't know if it's a proper paranormal encounter, but it's the only story that I still can't explain. I'm a female and I was hanging out in the car last night at about five in the morning with my best friend who's also female. I will refer to her as Heidi. We wanted to watch the sunrise, but we live in a pretty big city. So we were trying to find a flat high place where we could see the sky. Basically, I was just driving east until I found an empty parking lot or something that would be suitable. I guess we got distracted with the conversation because I drove probably a lot farther than I should have. Suddenly there weren't any buildings or lights around at all, just darkness and a few trees. Up ahead by a stop sign, there was this squarish gray shape that was lighter than the surrounding area. We both leaned forward and squinted to see what it was. Heidi asked what it was and I said, uh, it's where the road goes up or something like that. It was really dark, so I wasn't positive, but I was pretty sure. I think she said something else after that, but I don't really remember what it was because it was just a normal conversation. The road suddenly dipped and I drove up the slightest incline. I'm almost to the stop sign at the end, and then it hits us at the same time. Something is wrong. This feeling slams into me. The air goes still, the car goes quiet, and without even looking, I know my friend feels it too. I've never felt anything like it. Fear, I guess, but different somehow. My ears and the back of my neck were really hot, like that feeling just before you pass out. Almost like when you've stood too long with your knees locked, but I was wide awake and sitting. My heart was tight in my chest, like someone had their hand wrapped around it, and I felt sick to my stomach. Not like I was going to throw up, just really uneasy. It was like primal fear. I'm not really describing this well enough. It's kind of indescribable, but that's the gist of it. It was like my body knew something that my mind didn't, which is why the only word I really have for it is primal. This all hits me in the few seconds it takes me to get to the stop sign. When I pull up to it, I see that right in front of us is a roadblock with a big yellow sign on it. Dead end. My heart was beating so fast I couldn't even feel it. Neither of us were breathing. I'm not sure if I imagined it or not, but somehow the woods around us got even darker. Like unnaturally dark. I got this feeling 
that just kept telling me, I have to get us out of here right now. Turn around, my best friend says quietly. I don't look at her, but her voice is deadly serious. My head runs through the scenario impossibly fast. The road was too tight, so if I tried to turn around the way we'd come, I'd either hit a tree or I'd have to stop, reverse, stop, put it in drive over and over again. No thanks. I turned left instead, speeding out of there, and as I drove farther away, the horrible feeling gradually lessened, until it was less cold-blooded fear and more deep-seated discomfort. Did you feel that? Heidi said when we finally got to a stoplight and saw a building. We started talking to each other, just basically saying, what was that? And Heidi actually said it first, but apparently in the moment we had thought the exact same thing. I'm about to see something. I remember looking around in the dark when it happened, and I was just sure that I was going to see something. I don't even know what I was expecting, but I was just positive about it. Heidi said she looked away from the windows, but I was driving, and I didn't really get up the urge to look away for some reason. I don't know. I know nothing really happened, but this really spooked me. Heidi said something like, Maybe it was an animal hiding in the woods, or maybe there was a dead body, or maybe it was just a person who had really bad intentions. I don't know, but no logical human explanation feels sinister enough. I pulled up a satellite view on my phone of where we were, and there's not really much going on in that immediate area. Past the dead end sign, the woods get thicker and the road turns into gravel and eventually leads to this nonprofit organization, some kind of little church organization. There's a few little buildings built in a circle and what seems to be some mobile homes or RVs or something, and two to three houses, all in this little clearing in the middle of the woods. There's also a little river past that. Other than that, there's just not really anything around there. Still, I haven't stopped thinking about this since it happened. This is the true story of my childhood through adult years as I recount it. Rattlesnake Road is an original name to a road that has since been changed. I used it to maintain anonymity. I was born on Long Island, New York, and ever since I can remember, I've had really strange experiences. I was never able to sleep at night, and from a young age, I was always terrified of the dark. Yes, every child is afraid of the dark, but I was afraid for a reason that I was unable to explain until later in life. There are a few stories from while I was there, but I want to fast forward to when I was a little bit older and things began to make sense to me. My family purchased a second home and we moved to Colorado. We lived on a ranch located at the top of a hill that fed into the Rocky Mountains. There wasn't much around us, a few neighbors, our barn with our animals, and thousands of acres of hilly and mountainous terrain that surrounded our family. There was a long dirt road that led to our property, Rattlesnake Road. It was a perfect shot of the scenery leading up to our small three-bedroom home. It was quiet, peaceful, but the land was old. I was about seven years old at the time. This is when I began to understand what I was going through wasn't normal. Our home was small. It was a ranch style house with a three car garage, which took up half of the structure. The other half was built into the hillside where you entered from the front. You walked into the living room and you could see straight out the back sliding doors into the plains. In front of you was the kitchen, old with brick. Straight down the hallway, my room was on the right. My brother's room followed that 
and lastly my parents' room was on the left. The bathrooms connected and were on the right as well, wrapping around to the back of the house. I left the hallway lights on when I slept. I was scared to begin with, but something always felt as though it wasn't just our family there. One night, I was up and I couldn't fall back asleep. My parents and brother were sleeping as well. I could hear them snoring down the hall. My bedroom door was open and I was facing the hallway, when suddenly, the pull string to my closet made a click and the lights popped on. I could see the light making its way through the slatted shades of my closet accordion doors, and my heart began to race. Then, they shut off. The air in the room became cold, tense, almost as though the oxygen was being siphoned out. The silence set in. I couldn't hear the snoring anymore. I couldn't hear anything. I looked toward the hallway, and there was a short, black static mist. It had no facial features, but what I could see would have been a mouth. It seemed as though it was smiling ear to ear, which paralyzed me with an intense feeling of dread. It passed out my doorway and out of sight, not making a sound. Moments later, I heard what sounded like the door to our garage open and close and the air lifted. All of my surroundings returned to normal. I knew I was awake. I knew what I had seen there. And it visited me, only to get worse as time went on. That image will be burned into my mind for the rest of my life. apologize if this doesn't make sense, but I am freaked out and I have no idea how to explain this. My coworker and I were driving back from dinner to the place we were staying at. We had driven this route a handful of times and were very familiar with the surrounding area. It was a seven minute drive from the restaurant to where we were staying. We left the restaurant and had a straight drive for about two miles no turns until we had to take a right turn into the parking area of the property that we were staying at. As we approached the hotel, the tall Courtyard by Marriott sign was visible, as was the building. We were a block away from the turn, and then we just suddenly weren't. We were all of a sudden driving on a highway, about to take the exit to the right. It was immediately apparent and I said to my coworker, wait, something's wrong here. And he replied, yeah, what the heck just happened? We were just about to turn into the parking area. I told him to pull over and I looked up on maps where we were. The map showed that we were 20 minutes away in the opposite direction that we'd come from. It was physically impossible. The time on the clock was still the same as it had been when we were next to the hotel. I don't understand, and neither does he, and he doesn't want to tell anybody because it sounds so crazy. But somehow, we were teleported 20 minutes away. It was the single most disorienting feeling I have ever experienced. But now, ever since, I feel like everybody in my life has just changed. Everyone feels so distant. I can't shake the feeling that something is still very off. My family owns a factory in the north of England. The building is 1890s as far as I can tell and was built as a large shed for boilers that provided steam to power the steam engines in the big mill next door. The mill has since been demolished. It has a large water tank underneath it and a system to collect rainwater. The roof is made with cast iron trestles 
that incorporate internal gutters. It's fascinating. My brother is convinced that the place is haunted. Stuff apparently moves around on its own, and voices have been heard in the factory from the office when the factory was empty. We had an old bloke working for us a few years back who swears he saw the ghost of a man on several occasions. He did used to secretly drink several cans of John Smith's bitter whilst on shift though, so who knows? But he's not the only one. So far, I haven't experienced anything. But if I do, I'll be sure to let you know. I have had many paranormal, seemingly extraterrestrial, glitch in the matrix and skinwalker experiences. I think one too many for one person to have. The one I am going to tell you about freaks me out to this day. There is quite a bit of detail to this story, so I will try to make it as coherent as possible. The time was 2011, my final year of high school. Now, I am a Navajo from a small reservation in New Mexico, and the nearest city is 30 miles west. I attended a public school in that city. Therefore, I had to wake up at 5 a.m. every morning to catch the bus at 6, which picked up more kids along the way, and we would arrive with just enough time to get breakfast before class at 7.25. This particular morning seemed normal, my alarm went off at 5. I showered, fixed my hair, and was ready by 5.40. I would usually give myself 10 to 15 minutes to make some breakfast and pack my lunch. I did just that and decided to have Pop-Tarts that morning. I checked the time on the stove clock and it was 5.50. I popped the tarts into the toaster and went to my room to gather my things into my backpack. As I was finished with that, I saw that my alarm clock read 5.55, and I went to grab my Pop-Tarts. The stove clock read 5.56. We had a big clock right by our front door, and it also read 5.56. I checked the time often so that I could perfectly time my walk to the bus so that it showed up just as I arrived at my bus stop. Additionally, it was a winter morning, and it was dark out. The sun didn't start to come up until about 7, and I didn't want to be stuck in the cold dark for too long. Normally, when I stepped outside, there would be cars driving about, neighbors who turned on their vehicles to warm them up from a frigid winter night. But that morning, there was nobody, and that was a bit strange to me, but I didn't pay that fact any mind. Now, since it's the reservation, aka the middle of nowhere, where I lived, there wasn't much light either. Few residents had street lights in the cluster of homes where I lived. Unfortunately, the route that I walked every day had no street lights, so the only lights I could see in the near pitch black were the ones at my back from our porch light in the north, a neighbor's porch light who lived three acres away in the southern direction, and the far off lights of the city that lit the sky in the east. There were also the lights from the reservation clinic, which was about a mile south as well. I should also let you know that each home in a cluster of homes is set on an acre lot. My bus stop was two acres away. I would walk directly south to meet up with the only paved road, the highway, which met the dirt road in the east. From my home to that stop, it only took me a minute or two. When I stepped outside, Nothing was astir, which, like I said, was really odd. However, I wasn't out there alone, because although it was almost pitch black, I saw the silhouette of a girl who caught the bus at the same time as I did, and at the same stop. Good, I thought, I'm not out here alone. I followed about ten feet behind her. When we neared the stop, she veered off to the cattle guard, where she always sat to wait for the bus. I always sat on the porch steps of my uncle's house when the bus hadn't arrived yet, which was only about five to ten yards from the bus stop. 
When I sat on those steps, I started to notice more and more things that were out of place. One of those was the fact that my uncle, an early riser who was always awake by five, who always had his lights on by the time I was catching the bus, was not awake. He wasn't out having his morning coffee as usual. No lights, no sounds from inside his house. I thought, maybe he's sleeping in today. Then the neighbor whose home was three acres away from mine, my uncle's next door neighbor, whose porch light was on, would normally have had their vehicle running, warming up by now, and their lights would be on showing that somebody was awake and probably getting ready for work. But there were no signs of anybody being awake at all, and the truck wasn't on. Well, maybe they have the day off, I thought, still waiting for the bus. The other girl's silhouette I could see from the city lights that lit the sky to the east, and she was still sitting there and waiting as well. I was a little bit unsettled, but I didn't start to feel really creeped out until I started to hear the howls and yelps from what sounded to be a pack of coyotes that seemed to be only across the main highway. Since I didn't have a cell phone at the time, I had guessed that I was waiting for about 10 minutes. Finally, I thought, okay, this is ridiculous. Where is the bus? It should have been here by now. I was on time, and it was very unlike the bus or the bus driver to pick us up more than five minutes late. I decided to wake up my uncle and ask if maybe we had missed the bus, so I knocked on his door for a good three minutes, to no avail. Then I just decided to walk over and ask the girl if she wanted to walk back to our homes together, since I was sufficiently weirded out by the events. As I neared her and where she sat, my eyesight adjusted in the darkness, and when I was within arm's reach, I saw that there was nobody there. I thought I was going crazy. My mind raced and I felt panic and queasy in the pit of my stomach. All the creepy skinwalker and paranormal stories that I had heard over the years began to run amok in my mind. But what remains from those stories was that I was always told to never fear any of it. You should never be afraid of the evil things that lurk in the darkness, because your fear is their fuel. I decided not to panic and run home. Instead, I just walked briskly back home, still able to hear the whoops and calls from the nearby pack of coyotes and trying to figure out what was going on. When I got inside, I went to my mom's room and asked to use her cell phone. Just as she was about to hand me her cell, she took a second glance at the screen and said, It's four in the morning. What do you need my phone for? Shock took hold of my body, and all I could do was stand there with my mouth wide open as she trailed her remark with, Are you awake? Have you been sleepwalking? I have never sleptwalked in my entire life, and my reply felt forced, like I had to convince her that I was awake. I ran back to the kitchen. The clock read 4 a.m. The clock by the front door read 4 a.m. And the alarm clock in my room read 4 a.m. I don't know anything about any of these types of sleep disorders, but I seriously think that there's no way for me to have gone through with my usual routine the way that I did asleep. Needless to say, I was sufficiently freaked out and crawled back into bed. So freaked out, I didn't even take my shoes off. I fell asleep thinking of the whole situation, and ironically, I missed the bus that day. I told my third oldest sister, there are four of us and I'm the youngest, about what had happened. She was a little shocked at what she was hearing, and then she began to tell me of a dream she had before my experience. Now, her dreams we have begun to revere as visions of sorts, since she's had many of them end up coming true. Her earliest one, I remember, was when we were in elementary school, and my dad called and said that earlier in the day he was in a small airplane, and that they nearly crashed into the mountains near San Carlos, Arizona. She told us about a dream about being in an airplane, in a heavily forested area, that the plane was about to crash, but was able to land safely a few days before we got that call from our dad. Since then, she's had others, some she tells us about, others she doesn't. 
Before I tell you about the dream, I must also tell you about a weird incident that happened to said sister at my eldest sister's house. This particular incident happened the summer preceding the winter. I had a weird experience. My sister, the dream visionary, would stay over at my eldest sister's house to help babysit my nephews. They would stay up very late, and one night or morning, because it was around 2 a.m., they heard a sort of banging in the back of the house. My sister and the nephew went out to check. When they opened the door, they saw two horses, one white and one brown, kicking with their hooves and hitting their heads against the big garbage bins, which were knocking into the house. It was as if they were trying to get in, but for what, we had no clue. To add to that weirdness, my sister's house is in a housing development that has two entrances, and since it's on the reservation, those entrances have cattle guards. So how could those two horses have gotten in? Anyway, they chased the horses out of the yard and they galloped off to who knows where. Anyway, back to her dream. She said that she was asleep at my eldest sister's house and woke up to the same banging noise that those horses had been making that night in the summer. She said she got up and walked to the front window and looked out past the blinds and saw those same horses standing just inches from her on the other side of the window. Then she saw the two horses shape shift into people, an in-law and his son. They had menacing looks on their faces, and she said she felt that they were pure evil. She yelled at them to go away, and as soon as she turned away, she saw me, sleepwalking toward the back door. She went to grab me to put me back in bed, but as she got closer, she saw that the back door was wide open and that the sun was beckoning me to follow him, to go outside. As I took a few steps out the door, she pulled me back inside, slammed and locked the door, and laid me back down, and that was where her dream ended. The story, however, gets creepier. After that weird time warp occurrence coupled with my sister's dream, my mom decided to take me to see a medicine man to have a prayer ceremony. He said that it was a skinwalker who was messing with our family. He said that the skinwalker intended to destroy my mom's life, but that she was too strong, and that the harm it wished for her would then fall to her children, the weaker ones. And here I thought I was being pretty strong. Further, he said that the skinwalker impersonated the shadow of the girl who usually rode the bus with me and was also the one who created the sounds of the coyotes. The skinwalker created an illusion to lure me outside and that the skinwalker was someone within the family. After the prayer ceremony, he said that I should never repeat anything that he said or even the events that occurred. I don't think a lot of people heed that though. I don't know if he would call it a warning or advice from the medicine man, but a lot of Navajos, if you get close enough to them, and they're not super traditional, will tell you all about scary and weird skinwalker stories of their own. They're pretty common, and even the ones that caused them to have to get a prayer or ceremony done, they'll tell those too. And this story is mine. When I was 15 or so, a group of my friends and I all slept over at the leader of our friend group's house. This guy lived in the most absolutely rural area of our rural town, basically in the middle of the woods, a house just surrounded by thick walls of trees. In the evening, we decided to go out and start a bonfire deep in the woods, so we packed up got all of our materials and went straight out there. On the way to the spot that we'd be making our campfire at, he told us about how messed up and creepy his woods are and the numerous things he's seen. White skinny figures peeking around the shed, staring at him and running off when he looked at it, screaming and whispers from the woods, figures watching him, all that good stuff. It set the mood pretty well. 
By around seven o'clock that night, we had the campfire set up and it was pitch black outside as it was the middle of winter in New Hampshire. I can still remember how creepy the whole vibe was that night. You couldn't see a single thing besides the ring of light coming from the fire. Everything else was just a black wall of nothingness and the sound of the forest was so quiet that the silence was almost deafening. At least it was if we weren't talking. We ended up needing more firewood and a few other things that we were using for the campfire, so the leader took me to go with him to get it. Without a flashlight or any light source, he and I walked the mile and a half long trail back to his house in complete and utter darkness. It was all good, we were talking, joking with each other, having a good time and just hanging out when the first noises started. He immediately made me stop talking. To my left and my right were a bunch of different sounds, screaming, laughing, talking and whispering, shouting, people saying unintelligible words. It sounded like there was something around 20 people just surrounding us. The natural night vision had finally set in a decent amount and I looked over at my friend who had his head down and didn't say a single word. Known for being a complete goofball and a wild, funny dude, I had never seen him look so shaken and serious in my life. He had this look to him that still kind of haunts me to this day as I knew him pretty well and he always portrayed himself as the fearless leader type. Seeing him so shaken up and afraid was very unsettling. I started to say something along the lines of, what the heck is that? Before he cut me off and told me to be quiet, face forward, and not to pay attention to any of the sounds. I did what he said, and the next three minutes or so were incredibly uncomfortable and terrifying. I remember feeling sick to my stomach. By the time we reached his house, the sounds had stopped. We both grabbed what we needed in total silence. That's when I could really listen to the sheer quietness of that night. No birds, no sticks falling, not a single sound, absurdly silent. We walked back to the campsite and nothing else occurred that night. It's still my most unsettling and bizarre experience that I have no explanation for and I'll never forget it. This happened in 2009, during my summer holiday when I was eight years old. As we had done for many years, my family and I went to Cordoba, Argentina, and rented a cabin. Strange things often happened at that cabin, like objects moving around, strange noises, or even items that just disappeared. One night, I was sleeping when I suddenly got up in the middle of the night. I looked in front of me, and there was an old, creepy woman who was just staring at me. She didn't say a word, so I just closed my eyes and when I opened them, she was gone. I ran to my father's bedroom and told my parents, but of course they didn't believe me. About two years ago, we went to those cabins again. One day, I struck up a conversation with the owner and he was telling me about some strange noises he had heard that night. Surprised, I told him about the creepy vision that I had had. He just answered, you are not the first one that that has happened to. Many people have reported having visions of an old woman or a girl who stares at them in the night. My friend and I camped on his property in the middle of nowhere. 
It was in the area of Cane Creek, Kentucky, near Laurel Lake. There was no service, no noise, no anything but you and the woods. We set up our tent under an overhang and I was tasked with gathering the firewood. It was about 5 p.m. or so, and while collecting, I got this odd feeling, and then I started to hear whispers. They weren't saying anything I could make out. It was just murmurings. At that point, I got this creepy, odd feeling, and I moved closer to our camp to collect the firewood. I didn't want to stray very far after that, Night progresses and nothing out of the ordinary happens, until we climb into our sleeping bags. I heard footsteps in the leaves and more murmuring. I was getting really freaked out, but I know the best thing to do is to ignore it and sleep, and so I did. The following morning, my friend and I found ourselves awake at 5 a.m. He asked me if I had heard whispering last night. I told him I heard it twice and we were both just as baffled as the other. We were not the first people to camp in this area. His uncle and his friends attempted to camp there as well, but they couldn't make it through the night either. My dad is a hunter, and he refuses to go down there to hunt anymore, as well as another friend I have. His dad says that the air down there is rich in death. I don't know the reason for what happens down there, but... I won't be going back. In the summer of 2008, when I was 13, my encounters with the unexplained began. I spent my days at home, alone and everything was normal, until our dogs kept ending up outside. Then, things escalated. I began hearing unexplained sounds in the house, like footsteps pacing in the hallway and faint whispers. My mom confirmed she heard them too, but warned me not to tell my religious stepdad. The rest of that year went by without incident, but 2010 marked the escalation of paranormal activity. That year, my twin sister and her friend captured a strange, smoky presence in a photo. My mom even heard a voice whisper, ouch, in her ear. But the most extreme occurrences were yet to come, and they happened to me alone. My first brush with sleep paralysis was relatively calm, but a series of inexplicable events followed. All in a row, in one event, a cup in my room tipped over on its own. A bird hit my window, my light bulb exploded, and the cup fell again. I was spooked, but I tried to brush it off. The final and most haunting incident occurred a week later during my second episode of sleep paralysis. As I lay immobilized, my room darkened, and then it turned blood red. A robed figure appeared in my doorway, its eyes piercing into me, radiating evil. The numbers 13 and 3 appeared, and then the paralysis ended. Later at church, we read Psalm 13, 3. Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. I was chilled to the core and to this day, nothing has disturbed me more than that shadowy figure and those words. These events have left a lasting impact, and although I've had some mild paranormal experiences since then, nothing compares to the terror of that year. Even after losing my faith, the mystery of what I saw and felt still lingers. My husband's parents live in a tiny town in Alabama. They've lived there a long time. We went to visit them a few years back, 
and we were excited to get out of town for a bit, see some different scenery. His sister was graduating college, and we were going to celebrate. She is also an avid ghost hunter and believer. So when I told her about some of my experiences, she was excited to take me to some of the haunted locations around town. Cemeteries, old abandoned houses, and even a Hell's Gate, which we didn't actually end up going to, as I told her I had a bad feeling and refused. We drove around almost all night, just looking at different locations and talking about the history of the town. A lot of residual energy and weird feelings as we went to all these different places. We came to a cemetery in a new portion of town. Fancy houses surrounded it on three sides only. On the third side was a small canyon area of land. Nothing really felt off. The cemetery was new and didn't have many headstones yet. It was fenced off with ornate wrought iron fencing. We didn't see anything lurking, no shadows darting from tree to tree or headstone to headstone. It was just there. After walking around to the open side, where there were no houses, I asked his sister, let's call her Beth, how come there were no houses on this one side? She shrugged and said that they had stopped building months ago, even though this was supposed to be a new subdivision. They had purchased all this land and probably needed to figure out a way to build upon it since it was very canyon-like. We decided to get a closer look at the canyon area, although we couldn't see much since it was dark and our only lights were the street lights. We had walked far enough to be outside of what they illuminated. Far off in the distance, I saw what looked like a campfire. I pointed it out, but no one else saw it. Beth began to have a sinking feeling, and before she could say anything, I started getting a massive headache. I heard pounding like drums. I got flashes of images in my head of Native Americans dancing around a big fire. The night sky seemed blacker and darker than it had before. Beth grabbed my arms and said we needed to leave. My husband was already halfway back to the car. As I turned my back to the canyon, it was almost as though I had a twinge of fear run up my spine and a shiver, like I was somewhere we weren't supposed to be. So we ran back to the car. As we drove away, I could feel a black mass following our car as we drove the winding streets back to the main road. It felt big and foreboding, like it was flying behind us. I started to panic and I felt my throat and chest tighten. Once we crossed the main road, it was almost like it couldn't follow us past that point, but I could feel it, watching us as we continued back to his parents' house. I asked Beth if she had seen anything, but she refused to talk about it. None of us slept that night, and my headache didn't subside until morning. I did some research on the area the next day and found that it was home to the Chickasaw Indian tribe back in the day. I have Blackfoot and Choctaw blood and later thought that maybe, since I was a neighboring tribe, they didn't want me there. Regardless, we have never spoken of the incident since. This happened when I was little, and I recently remembered it when talking to my parents this weekend about strange things we did as a kid. They told me that this one spoils them to this day, and after talking, I actually have one or two vague memories of it. This story took place when my family and I still lived in a small neighborhood in Alabama. We had moved into a small house that had a backyard, which connected to a small forest. I believe I was six at the time, and my younger brother had just been born. My parents got the house for less than expected, and were excited to start a new life in this quiet neighborhood. The first night at the house, my parents said they heard scratching coming from somewhere in the house. My dad said that he brushed it off as being an animal from the forest nearby, or maybe a mouse, 
and went back to sleep. It continued for several nights, though, and my dad eventually grew tired of it. One night, he decided to look and see what was causing the scratching noise. He found me kneeling at and scratching the door that led to the basement. He tried talking to me, but I would just continue to scratch. My dad watched me for a minute before I finally stopped scratching and walked back to my room. The next morning, he asked me about why I was up and, according to him, I didn't know what he was talking about. My parents took me to the doctor and they told them that the most logical cause was that I was having night terrors, since it appeared to occur nightly. My parents accepted this as an answer for a while. The thing was, I would only have night terrors in that specific house. Whenever we would spend the night at my grandparents or I would have a sleepover at my friend's house, I never had these night terrors. And then there came one part that I somehow remember. It happened when I was a little older, around nine or 10. I remember waking up in the hallway where the basement door was. I didn't remember getting up and I was confused as to how I got there. I remember turning my head to see what looked like an elderly man. He had a kind of yellowish glow to him, and he was staring right at me. I don't remember feeling threatened by him, though. I think I might have fallen asleep again, because the next thing I remember is waking up in the hallway again, but this time it was morning. After the night where I saw the old man, my parents said my night terrors stopped. We moved out of that house several years later, when I was getting ready to go into the third grade. My parents brought up this story because they told me that recently, one of our old neighbors had done some research on the house. What they found out was that an old man had unalived himself in the basement of that house years before my family had moved in. Our neighbor didn't tell them the full story over what led to that, but my parents believe that that might have been the old man that I saw that night. I'm now 20 years old and I'm enrolled in college. Neither I nor my parents have been back to that house since we moved out of it. In a way, I kind of want to visit just one last time to see if maybe I could find out about the old man. I'm just really curious about him. Either way, it was an experience I doubt my parents will forget anytime soon. I've always been a believer in the paranormal, but I've also been a skeptic. I'm not one to jump to paranormal conclusions right away. With that said, this event messed me up and it still keeps me up at night to this day. This happened almost a year ago. My girlfriend and I visited her parents' house, which was her old home in Alabama, specifically in Crenshaw County. For those that don't know, that's basically right in the middle of nowhere, the boonies, the sticks. Being from a large city myself in Southern California, I'm completely out of my element. I've already visited her parents once before with her. She has always told me that her house was haunted and that the woods were sketchy at night. But when I visited the first time with her, nothing happened whatsoever. So I chalked it up as some tall tale to creep me out. You know, freak out the city boy. That is until we visited her parents the second time. Her father works in Montgomery for the weekdays, so he's gone a lot and her mother had to be in Atlanta for three days due to a job. We were home alone for those three days, unless you want to count her cats as well. The one-story house is in the middle of absolutely nowhere, with the nearest house well down the road from us. One of those nights around midnight, I'm sitting in bed with her completely asleep. I'm scrolling through Facebook and my Twitter and YouTube notifications when I began hearing what sounded like my girlfriend's voice. I turned to look at her to see if she was sleep talking. Nothing, she's quiet. I continue going through my notifications for a bit and I hear her again. 
but this time it doesn't sound like it's coming from her. It sounds like it's coming from outside, behind the bedroom wall, toward the same direction as my girlfriend, but much louder and echoey. I get up and I look around to see if there's a TV on or if the cats are making noises, even though the TVs aren't in the direction that I heard the voice coming from. But nothing. The TVs are off and the cats are asleep or just lazing around. I even checked her phone, which was on the nightstand to my right, in case it was playing audio or something, but it was just charging. I go back to bed with her and I continue going about my business, but this time I'm kind of looking out for the voice. This time I hear it again, but much clearer and louder, and it sounds exactly like my girlfriend's voice. It was for sure coming from outside this time. I know this because she was sleeping on my left, and toward my left is also the wall. On the other side of that is a clearing, and it's all dense woods. After this, I focused all of my attention to the loud voice to see if I would hear it again, and I'm looking at her to make sure that it's not her. This is the part where I internally started saying, I am not finding out what you are. I have seen way too many movies and YouTube videos, and I'm not about to go out there and find out. I heard the voice one more time, yet this time it didn't sound closer, but just a little farther, which leads me to believe that it's something physically moving around the clearing bordering the woods. The scariest thing about the voice that really had me freaking out is that it was still clear enough that I started making out human speech but it was messed up. Like it was speaking in phrases using my girlfriend's voice, but none of the words were making sense. It's almost like it was trying to speak English, but it was reversed. At that point, I did one final check around the interior of the house to see if all the doors were locked. My rational mind was thinking it was probably just some lost person in the woods, definitely not a skinwalker or whatever else. I made sure the curtains were closed and I just went to bed. I told my girlfriend the very next morning and she seemed rightfully freaked out, but we ended up just cracking jokes about it to cope. I posted this experience to Facebook about a week after and a lot of my friends threw around the thought that it could very well have been something paranormal. A friend of my girlfriend's who studies cryptozoology as a hobby asked me a ton of questions relating to the incident and basically flat out said, yeah, that's a Wendigo. I don't know how credible of an opinion that would be. I'm inching into believing it though, because what I heard that night was exactly my girlfriend's voice. I swear I could make out my name in that garbled speech. I'm not too sure on that much, but it was like it was luring me into the woods. Whatever it was, it got my girlfriend's voice, pitch, tone, patterns, everything, just right enough for me to listen, but not enough to get me to go out there with it. Of course, I was looking at her, so I knew it wasn't her. Who knows what I might have done, I guess, if she hadn't been in the room with me. I haven't been back since, but we are planning to go back in October and go to Disney World with her family. I'm hoping that whatever it was, isn't there anymore. This started a few years ago, and so far there's been no explanation of the things that keep occurring. I live in the southern United States near a national park, in a fairly rural area. So our first guess was that this had to be some sort of wildlife. Something that was scaring us for no reason other than us getting into our own heads. However, after a ton of internal explanations, we finally came to the conclusion that we had none. The first thing that occurred was fairly brief. It was shortly after the death of my uncle, who was fairly close to us before he passed. He was a veteran, and while in the army, he had volunteered to have shock treatments that altered his personality greatly. 
This had occurred during the Vietnam era while he was stationed in Germany. My grandmother was in the bathroom and I was in my room just playing a game. When out of the blue, the wall sounded as if somebody was beating on it, trying to get our attention. Three loud knocks, then nothing. We were worried that something had happened to our neighbor, an elderly woman, and that she needed our help. But after we went outside to check, there was nobody there. Fast forward a few months, we started hearing footsteps on the roof. They started out light and easily explainable, something along the lines of a cat walking on the roof. We had seen it happening a few times, so we thought nothing of it, until they started to get a bit heavier. Eventually, it sounded like something that weighed a lot more than a cat, even more than I did, was sprinting across the roof every night from one end of the house to the other. Things got worse after that. We started to find dead animals around the property. And while some of it could easily be explained as roadkill, we do have a lot of problems with people speeding due to a lack of police presence in the area. There was also a ton of random things that we would find dead nearby. We would find crows and ravens laying in our backyard, the occasional snake, and one time, we found a deer that apparently walked onto our property and dropped dead. There was not a single sign of a wound or anything when we found it. We started to hear things inside the house soon after, seeing things out of the corner of our eyes that would vanish before we could turn to get a good look at it. Scratching mainly, we've put rat traps and every kind of poison we could think of in our walls but there's no sign of vermin. We would hear whispers at night, like somebody was trying to talk to us. We're rational people. We checked to see if there were any cracks in the windows or door frames that could make the wind blow in and sound strange. But from everything that we've checked, there doesn't seem to be any opening that could make that noise. One of my old friends, who before this story was as skeptical as I was, was sitting in my living room playing something on our PlayStation when he thought he saw somebody walk past the window. It doesn't sound too scary, right? Well, no, until you consider that my windows are nearly 10 feet off the ground. Our house is raised to allow water to pass underneath it to prevent any water damage. And the place that he claims to have seen the man wasn't near any stairs. He came to visit another time about a month later. We were sitting and talking to one another when he said that he needed to use the bathroom and he left to do his business. He goes and when he comes back, he's pale white and terrified. When I asked him what was wrong, he was evasive. So we just got in the car and drove down to Sonic to grab some food and talk. That's when he told me that he saw somebody staring at him from my room as he walked back smiling at him, and that it had yellow eyes. He doesn't come around anymore. At least he doesn't stay after nightfall. I don't know if what he claims is true or not, but it still scares me to think about just how scared he was. He's just not the type, so I'm inclined to believe. I've tried cleansing the house with sage. We've got a crucifix in every room now. Near the front door, we have three. We've even duct taped the back door shut and we have it locked to be absolutely certain that nothing can get in. We just don't have any explanation. This is a true story that happened to me, which I am weary to share, as there have been many times where I have opened up about this, only to be met with ridicule. I hope you'll take this seriously, because I do. Back in 2008, my girlfriend and I decided to go to an abandoned mental asylum off Highway 82 in Alabama, called Old Bryce. It shut down a few years back due to malpractice, 
and some of the ghost legends, like the number two ghost, involve murder by staff at the facility. Essentially, this was a dumping ground for people that society didn't know what to do with. Thousands of people were sent there and died there. The facility consisted of four buildings, Bryce, the residential hall, S.D. Allen, the medical facility, the crematorium, and the guard shack. I have seen two ghosts in the residence hall, the bigger of the two I will share with you now. My second visit to old Bryce was strange. It was my first time inside the building, and I came prepared. It was my girlfriend, me, and our friend Chris. I had a flashlight and a DVD camcorder. Through the main entrance is a staircase on the right, which zigzags up to the second floor, complete with anti-side fence at the top. Make a left, then another left, then a quick right, and you're in the hall that led to the children's corridor. I had the flashlight in my left hand and the camera in my right, scanning, trying to catch something. On the left, at the entrance to that room, there was a bathroom with only a tub in it. I thought I saw something in the bathroom and shined the light that way. Nothing. I moved the camera and the light, thought I saw it again and shined it back. Nothing. Our night continued and finished without incident. The next day I reviewed the footage. In that bathroom, I shined towards something I thought I saw, and I was right. When the light pans to the right, a bluish-white illuminated little girl's face peers out from behind the door to follow the light. As the light shines back in her direction over the course of two frames, she is half behind the door, and in the next frame she's gone. My heart felt like an ice cube ran through it. I was in such shock. I proceeded to show everybody that I knew. The girl's appearance was that of a younger girl, maybe younger than 10, hair parted in the middle, unusually large forehead, and some apparent deformation or disorder. I made the mistake of leaving the camera at a friend's house overnight, who apparently was not my friend because he stole it. I know, I know, but it's the truth. This is where it gets weirder. Two and a half years later, I was living in a different city. One of the legends of old Bryce is that the windows grow back. If you do any damage to them, they'll just grow back over and spirits will follow you home. Well, I broke a window. I was laying in bed one night at about three or four in the morning. I was on the verge of sleep, aware of where I was and very comfortable. Out of nowhere, this immobilizing tingling sensation started at the tips of my toes. I was laying on my stomach with my arms under the pillow, completely helpless as this sensation crept its way slowly up my legs, midsection, and eventually my entire body over the course of about 20 seconds. Once it fully covered me, I heard the whisper of a little girl directly in my ear say, I'm in your room. It gave me shivers. And for some reason, I said out loud, I love you. The feeling stopped and it left me on the verge of tears. I don't know what possessed me to say that, but it was really emotional and terrifying. It may or may not have been that little girl from the asylum, but according to the legend, it makes sense. Either way, it's the most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me. Back when I was 18 or 19, I had decided to go to church. It was a church in Cherokee, Alabama, and I went with my once friend, we'll call him Joel, and his family. I had gone in, and Joel and I were directed to the basement with all of the other people who were under 20 to do something. Some kind of class, maybe. I forget what it was. But maybe five to seven minutes in that basement, I get the most blinding headache and excuse myself outside to get some air. 
I wait for everybody to get done and we head back to where Joel and his parents lived. The whole ride, this headache is just not going away. I stayed at their house maybe an hour or two while this headache gets worse and worse. I decide to attempt to drive myself home to Crooked Oak. As I'm driving, the headache becomes all but blinding and halfway home in the night on this dark road, I stop at this tiny little backwoods church. The pain is so immense I can't focus on anything, at which point I was pretty much wishing to be struck dead just to escape it. I stumbled out of my Jeep and I landed on the first bit of grass I could find, and I pretty much passed clear out. After a good stretch of time, the pain left me. I went to drag myself to the Jeep, and with my senses returned, I realized that I was laying on someone's old grave. I don't know why it helped, and of course I didn't do it intentionally, but there it is. To this day, I refuse to go near that church. I don't know what's in that basement, but I don't want to encounter it again. When I was a kid, I lived in Alabama, way out in the country. My best friend at the time lived about a mile away, and my older brother and I would go over there daily during the summer. Near his property is a dead forest. All the trees are there, but they never have any leaves. It's pretty darn creepy to begin with. Sometimes we played in there, but we never went very far. One day, my brother and my friend, let's call him Sam, wandered off while I was messing with a turtle, and they disappeared. Once I was done playing with the turtle, not hurting it or anything, I went around the property looking for them, until I thought I saw one of them head into the woods. By this time, it was late afternoon and getting darker. I ran to the woods, but I couldn't see them. Then I heard what sounded like them talking, deeper in. I followed the voices and they kept seeming farther and farther away, as though I should have been getting closer. And then they stopped. And suddenly I felt really scared. At that moment, I realized that the sun had already set and it was starting to get very dark. So I ran all the way back to Sam's house. My older brother and Sam were playing Nintendo in his room and thought that I was still in the backyard playing with a turtle. I never did figure out what I was chasing in those creepy woods, but I'm kind of glad that I never did. I used to live in this old house with my grandparents out in the middle of nowhere in the south of Alabama. The closest town was maybe 30 to 40 minutes drive away. The land we lived on was my pop's family land and it was passed down through many generations. I was in middle school when all of this took place. I have always had problems sleeping at night so my grandparents let me stay up at night. This one night, I remember to this day because my best friend, who's basically my sister, was with me at the time. We were in the second living room, what I call the family room, and we were just having fun talking, girl sleepover type stuff. The family room connected to the dining room. We had the windows open because it was a hot summer night in this old house that didn't have air. My friend and I were playing and out of nowhere, I felt this unknown energy. For some reason, everything went dead silent. I looked at the open window and I saw the curtain blowing. I thought it was the wind, but I was so wrong. The wind wasn't blowing, not at this time. None of the other curtains were billowing. Out of nowhere, I see the silhouette of a woman the description I would give of her would be like a 1950s housewife with her dress and 
straight hair, but the end curled out. I looked at her for so long, trying to wrap my brain around what was going on. I was a little scared of her, but I didn't feel like I was in danger. She disappeared, and when she did, the curtain quit blowing and everything went back to normal. I thought I was crazy, but then my friend looked at me and said, you saw that too, right? I nodded yes. Both she and I went to the window to see if anybody was out there, and to see if the wind was blowing, but no to both. What really freaked us out was how far out in the middle of nowhere we were. There's no reason that anybody else would even be out there. And after that, I have never seen her again. So this is a true story that happened to me, which I'm weary to share, as there have been many times where I've opened up only to be met with ridicule. But I hope you take this seriously, because I do. Back in 2008, my girlfriend and I decided to go to an abandoned mental asylum off of Highway 82 in Alabama called Old Bryce. It shut down a few years back due to malpractice, and some of the ghost legends like the number two ghost, involve murder by staff at the facility. Essentially, this was a dumping ground for people that society didn't know what to do with. Thousands of people were sent there, and died there. The facility consisted of four buildings. Bryce, the residence hall, S.D. Allen, the medical facility, the crematorium, and the guard shack. I have seen two ghosts in the residence hall, the bigger of the two, I'll share with you now. My second visit to Old Bryce was strange. It was my first time inside the building, and I came prepared. It was me, my girlfriend, and our friend Chris. I had a flashlight and a DVD camcorder. Through the main entrance is a staircase on the right, which zigzags up to the second floor, complete with an anti-side fence at the top. Make a left, then another left and then a quick right and you were in the hall that led to the children's corridor. I had the flashlight in my left hand and my camera in the right, scanning, trying to catch something. On the left at the entrance to that room, there was a bathroom with only a tub in it. I thought I saw something in the bathroom and shined the light that way, nothing. I moved the camera and light thought I saw it again and shined it back. Nothing. Our night continued and finished without incident. The next day I reviewed the footage. In that bathroom, I shined towards something I thought I saw, and I was right. When the light pans to the right, a bluish-white, illuminated little girl's face peers out from behind the door to follow the light. As the light shines back in her direction over the course of just two frames, she's behind the door halfway, and in the next frame, she's gone. My heart felt like ice water had run through it. I was in such shock. I proceeded to show everybody I knew. The girl's appearance was that of a younger one, maybe 10, hair parted in the middle, an unusually large forehead, and was deformed in some way. I made the mistake of leaving the camera at a friend's house overnight, who apparently was not my friend because he stole it. This is where it gets even weirder, though. Two and a half years later, I was living in a different city. One of the legends of old Bryce is that windows grow back, and if you do any damage to them, spirits will follow you home. I broke a window on accident. I was laying in bed one night at about 3 to 4 a.m., I was on the verge of sleep, aware of where I was, and very comfortable. Out of nowhere, this immobilizing, tingling sensation started at the tips of my toes. I was laying on my stomach with my arms under the pillow, completely helpless, as this sensation crept its way slowly up my legs, midsection, and eventually my entire body over the course of maybe 20 seconds. Once it covered me, I heard the whisper of a little girl directly in my ear say, I'm in your room. 
I cringed tightly, and for some reason I said out loud, I love you. The feeling stopped, and the whole incident left me on the verge of tears. It may or may not have been that little girl from the asylum, but according to legend, it makes sense. In order to really convey how scared I was when this happened, I'm gonna have to back up and give you a little context. For starters, I've told the whole story to maybe a handful of my closest friends, and the only family I've ever told is my twin sister. Even then, it only came up because they initiated conversations about similar topics regarding the paranormal. If I can help it, I'd rather not talk about it in real life. But here, on the wilds of the internet though, I guess I feel a little bit safer. It's also worth noting that I've included several instances that may or may not be related. Whether or not they truly are is a matter of personal speculation, but they are all paranormal nonetheless. If I had to pinpoint where it all began, I would say it was 2008, when I stayed home alone pretty much all summer. My sisters attended the Boys and Girls Club, and my parents worked all day. I was just a 13-year-old boy then, so staying home alone was pretty much the greatest thing I could think of. All I had on the agenda every day was eating junk food, playing video games, and doing whatever small chores I was assigned. Not a bad way to spend a summer. And it wasn't. For a few weeks, anyhow. When things started, though, they started small. Every couple of days, my mom would come home pissed off when she saw both of our dogs outside. We lived in North Alabama, so summer was hot and swampy. Because of that, we tended to keep the dogs inside until they needed to be let out to do their business, but it would never be any more than about 10 minutes. I loved those dogs, so I adhered to the 10-minute rule very strictly. It was also why I was so confused to see them outside on those days. I definitely did not let them out. Sure, I can be forgetful sometimes. Maybe one or two of those times I really did just have a brain fart. But I was 100% sure that most of those times I never let those dogs out. When I told that to my mom, she looked kind of concerned. Then I started hearing things. With freshly installed hardwood floors, I was familiar with the sound of them settling when the AC kicked on. It would be one or two popping sounds, then it would stop, until the AC turned off again. Rinse and repeat. Nothing crazy about that. One day, while I was binge playing old Nintendo games, I heard the board settling again. But this time, it wasn't because of the AC. And instead of one or two pops, there were several dozen, moving around. They went up and down the hallway, like somebody was pacing around. I paused my game and I listened to them. Thinking maybe my mom or my stepdad were back early from work, I went out to see them and make sure the dogs were back inside so I wouldn't get chewed out again. But nobody was home. I shrugged it off as the floorboards just being particularly active that day and I went back to playing my game once more. About an hour passed before the sounds repeated. The same quiet little footsteps. I paused my game again, and I listened harder this time. Another sound surfaced on top of the steps. It was kind of like trying to hear somebody else's phone call from across the room. You know there's a conversation going on, but you can't quite make out what it's about. I went to look again, this time going all the way across the house and into my parents' room. Still nobody. Then I thought, well, maybe the conversation was coming from outside in the neighborhood. I brought the dogs out back with me, and they went and did their business while I waited on the porch. From what I could tell, it was just another stiff, silent summer day. This particular thing happened a few more times, and it always made me feel really uneasy. It was even worse when I told my mom about it. She replied, oh good, you hear it too. Then she went on to tell me not to tell my stepdad, 
because he was very religious and for some reason didn't believe in any of this stuff. Things settled down after summer was over and they stayed that way for a while. I had school to keep me occupied and other than a few small instances, we had two quiet years. 2010 was the year things picked up a lot more. While my twin and my girlfriend at the time were hanging out in her room, they started messing around taking dumb pictures with digital cameras. Now my twin's room was the coldest in the house and nobody could ever figure out why. It also used to belong to my older sister. Both times either of them moved into the room, their demeanor would change over the course of a few months. Where my older sister became more manic, throwing tantrums with growing frequency, my twin was starting to get depressed, sleeping all the time and always being fairly disconnected. While all three women in the house suffered from manic depression, bipolar disorder, and sometimes both, there was a very noticeable difference when my sisters occupied the room. And that digital camera my twin was playing around with? There was a picture on it that we didn't find for weeks after the fact that showed my girlfriend at the time and a really weird, smoky, veil-like presence in the room with them. Neither of them smoked, and the room never smelled like anything, so we weren't allowed to have candles in our room either. I'm still kicking myself for not saving that photo somewhere, because I think it might have been a good piece of evidence. On top of the apparition caught on my camera, my mother told me of an instance where footsteps walked from the kitchen and into the study where she worked on some stuff for her job. When the steps entered the room, she heard a voice whisper, ouch, very clearly into her ear. The next few experiences were things only I witnessed. They are, by and large, the more extreme parts of what I now guess to be a haunting, and they started in the summer of the same year, with my first episode of sleep paralysis. I had known about the phenomenon before it happened to me. My mom was a sufferer of frequent night terrors and the occasional paralysis. I also had a friend with narcolepsy that told me about it at school. The first time it happened to me, I wasn't too unsettled. It was on a weekend and I drifted off watching Netflix. The next thing I knew, I was wide awake and a few episodes of the show had gone by. I reached for a bottle of water by my bed, but I found that I couldn't move at all. It was strange and almost calm. I just kind of accepted what was happening and I let it run its course. It eventually did. I got up, had a drink of water, went to the bathroom and then went back to bed. A few days after the paralysis, things started moving around on their own. Another day spent home alone, I was once again playing video games and avoiding any responsibilities. As I had tried giving up soda that year, I almost always had a cup on my desk filled either with orange juice or empty. There was rarely an in-between. This cup, however, just fell over in front of my eyes. There was no slant on the desk or anything like that. Nothing other than the cup was on it. It just tipped over, like someone had smacked it over. While I thought it was odd, I set it back upright and went on with my gaming. I had settled that it was some kind of trick of gravity, which in hindsight sounds way more ridiculous than a poltergeist. This was immediately followed by the sound of a bird hitting my window, my light bulb exploding overhead and the cup once again tipping over. Unable to rationalize it this time, I scrambled out of my room and into the kitchen where my stepdad was eating. As I said earlier, my mom asked me not to talk to him about anything paranormal, but I was pretty shook up by what I had just seen. He asked me if I was all right. I told him that a bird had flown into my window and kind of scared the crap out of me, to which he laughed. I didn't sleep very well that night. The last and most extreme incident I had at that house happened just about a week later, my second episode of a sleep paralysis. It was a Sunday morning and I could hear my family moving about the house to get ready. It didn't take me long to prepare myself, so I tended to sleep in an extra 15 minutes. As I fell back to sleep, a familiar feeling came over me. Unable to speak, I couldn't call for help. A weight on my chest made it difficult to breathe. I was incapable of moving. Thinking it would pass like last time, I just 
waited. It became evident very quickly that this was not going to be like last time. What little daylight there was coming in through the curtains turned blood red. Instead of the calm I had during the first episode, I grew very unsettled. It was dark now, and the room looked like one of those photo development rooms in terms of color. My door opened on its own. A figure stood there, just looked like a silhouette, all dark and shrouded. It wore what appeared to be a robe made of thick fur, and kept its hood drawn over. Even though my room was normally comfortable, I felt the temperature drop. I could see my own breath, and the breath of this figure. It just kept staring at me. Something about it felt evil, like it was waiting to do something awful to me. I tried to yell and make it go away. I even attempted to invoke the name of Christ, but I couldn't speak or breathe enough to do so. The blood red changed to pitch black. The figure disappeared into it, but a pair of dark red eyes pierced through me from where it stood. I then saw two numbers sort of fly at me, 13 and 3. That's when the paralysis ended, I got up, and I went to church. I've since lost my faith and I'm no longer religious. Just what I saw that morning is still a mystery to me. But I did follow up on those two numbers that same morning in church. Psalm chapter 13, verse 3, reads in the King James Version, quote, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Needless to say, I got chills, and I still do every time I tell the story. I'll never forget that summer before entering seventh grade, sometime in July. It was a Wednesday night leading into the early hours of Thursday. The previous evening, my family and I had watched an old episode of Unsolved Mysteries. Later that night, I awoke, lying on my right side, my eyes still closed, enveloped in silence. In those days, none of us used fans to help us sleep. I was awake, but simply waiting to drift back into slumber. But curiosity got the better of me and I decided to open my eyes. What I saw next, I will never be able to explain. A being was right beside my bed, fixated on a plush bear I kept with me. This creature resembled everything I had heard or seen on TV about aliens. Shorter, with pale gray skin, and those haunting, huge, black, slanted eyes. The shock I felt at that moment is beyond words, especially since I was only about 12 years old at the time. Pulling my covers over my head, I felt a rush of warmth and coolness over my body, which I realized later was probably shock. Fear paralyzed me. Too terrified to scream, my mind raced with a million thoughts. What if my family came rushing into my room? What would this creature do? Was it going to kill or abduct me? Had it already done so and it was just returning me? The experience was so awful that even recounting it now sends shivers down my spine. Summoning my so-called courage as an 11-year-old, I decided to try and frighten it by thrashing my legs under the covers. But nothing happened. I stayed hidden, the terror lasting for what felt like 12 hours. Finally, I heard a strange noise, a crisp sound that seemed to surround me. Lasting only about two seconds, it was something I had never heard before, nor have since. Somehow, I knew they were gone, as if the sound was their transportation leaving. I couldn't sleep for the rest of the night, and it took me a long time to even share this harrowing experience with my family. They didn't believe me at first, but my mother occasionally brings it up now, suggesting that it might be the reason I suffer from insomnia, and she might be right.
At the age of 10, I had my first encounter. It was with an enormous floating ship, shaped like a massive manta ray. The moment I laid eyes on it, a strange sensation washed over me, as though I had been aboard it for some time. I quickly brushed that unsettling feeling aside and fled home. The memory has a way of returning to me now and again, bringing with it hazy recollections of the ship's interior. Vague and fleeting, these memories also hint at companionship aboard the ship, although I have no concrete sense of who might have been with me. Years later, another sighting occurred. This time, I saw a craft landing in my parents' cow pasture out in the countryside. What happened next is still puzzling to me. I was irresistibly drawn inside the house, and all memories of the sighting seemed to vanish from my mind. A gap in my memory appeared, several hours for which I have no account. Though I once assumed I had simply watched TV during that time, I eventually came to realize that I had no recollection of those hours at all, TV or otherwise. More recently, I have begun to notice strange lights in the sky. Whenever I ask aloud, are you here for me? The lights respond, bobbing and weaving, or momentarily flashing brighter. Each time this occurs, I go inside, only to lose memory of the subsequent hours. This pattern continues to this day. All these experiences have led me to develop various theories. Occasionally, fragments of conversations come back to me, discussions about my life, my emotions, my goals, and my constructive insights on personal improvement. Though the faces of my conversational partners remain a mystery, these encounters have had a positive impact. My life has gradually improved over the past decade. These mysterious meetings don't frighten me. I am aware of their occurrence, and I acknowledge their tangible effects on my life. What I don't know is whether I'm ready to remember more. The experiences are there, just beyond the edge of recollection, and I remain in a state of uncertainty, wondering what might be revealed if those memories fully resurface.